Hey guys, welcome back to the AI in Your Job podcast, the podcast where we discuss all things AI as it relates to work and life. I'm your host, Jack Forrester. Uh, before we get started, you can send your questions and comments to AI in Your Job at gmail.com. Let me know what you do for work and how susceptible you think your job is to being augmented or replaced by AI. Also, please subscribe and rate the show in whatever platform you're using to listen. Let's get into some headlines. From science.org, and that's an actual website you can check out, quote, we're changing the clouds. An unintended test of geoengineering is fueling record ocean warmth, end quote. So this is a bit outside of our normal subject matter, but in this case, I thought it was important. And I'll tell you why in a minute, but this article discusses warming ocean temperatures and lays out what we already know that greenhouse gases are the primary driver of that warming. However, scientists have recently learned that there's another reason for those warming ocean temperatures, and that's disappearing clouds known as ship tracks. So from that article, quote, regulations imposed in 2020 by the UN, the UN's International Maritime Organization, or IMO, have cut ship sulfur pollution by more than 80% and improved air quality worldwide. Well, that sounds good. Uh, The reduction has also lessened the effect of sulfate particles in seeding and brightening the distinctive low-lying reflective clouds that follow in the wake of ships and help cool the planet. The 2020 IMO rule is a big natural experiment, says an atmospheric physicist at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. We are changing the clouds. By dramatically reducing the number of ship tracks, the planet has warmed up faster, several new studies have found. That trend is magnified in the Atlantic, where maritime traffic is particularly dense. In the shipping corridors, the increased light represents a 50% boost to the warming effect of human carbon emissions. It's as if the world suddenly lost the cooling effect from a fairly large volcanic eruption each year, says another atmospheric scientist at Florida State University. End quote. So we talked previously about the dangers of AI and unintended consequences. I'm sure the scientists and legislators behind this new maritime law thought they were fighting the good fight, but little did they know that their actions would lead to ocean temperatures rising. This example may be small, but if applied to AI and the massive innovation it will bring about, even our best intentions could be swallowed up by these unintended consequences. From Futurism.com, quote, someone directed an AI to destroy humanity, and it tried its best, end quote. So I'd like to think that this person was an AI researcher trying to test the limits of AI, but it appears to be what we all fear, uh, Now, I don't think this person was bent on actually trying to destroy humanity, but whether their motives were to be funny or nefarious, that they actually tried is concerning. From that article, quote, a user behind an experimental open source attempt to make GPT-4 fully autonomous created an AI program called Chaos GPT, designed to destroy humanity, establish global dominance, and attain immortality. Chaos GPT got to work immediately, attempting to source nukes and drum up support for its cause on Twitter. Well, let's hope that these large AI labs are paying attention to news just like this and the necessary safeguards are being put in place to protect us from folks just like this. Our next article is from The Independent, quote, Chat GPT creator working on mystery AI device with iPhone designer, end quote. So apparently OpenAI, who created ChatGPT, which started this craze um, in the last year, is in talks with uh, the renowned iPhone designer to create some sort of AI device. SoftBank has already committed to invest more than a billion dollars into this product. And speculation is running rampant, with pundits guessing that it will be anything from a new phone to a ChatGPT-enabled speaker, or headphones or something like that. It'll be interesting interesting to see what happens, and OpenAI is widely heralded as a company that delivers and delivers often, so it may be sooner than later that we have a hard OpenAI product to carry us 
into our dystopic technological future. From the New York Times, quote, the new chat GPT can see and talk. Here's what it's like, end quote. So chat GPT goes multimodal, meaning it can do other things than output text. We touched this on we touched on this briefly last time, but chat GPT up until this point has been text to text. You put text in and you get text out. This update seems as large as if not larger than the launch of GPT itself. So from that article, quote, the first is an update that allows ChatGPT to analyze and respond to images. You can upload a photo of a bicycle, for example, and receive instructions about how to lower the seat or get recipe suggestions based on a photo of the contents of your refrigerator. The second is a feature that allows users to speak to ChatGPT and get responses delivered in a synthetic AI voice, the way you might talk with Siri or Alexa. These features are part of an industry-wide push towards so-called multimodal AI, systems that can handle text, photos, videos, and whatever else users might decide to throw at them. The ultimate goal, according to some researchers, is to create, create an AI capable of processing information in all the ways that a human can. End quote. Well, of course it is. That's their goal. An AI that can handle processing that type of information combined with, you know, robotics will be, I think, the world we're headed for. A software with that capability used in a humanoid robot will be world-changing. But for the short term, I think the voice-to-voice -voice capability will be massive. This will, of course, enable AI companions, friends, or assistants that you can converse with audibly versus simply texting with. And this is not your Siri or Alexa, uh, if you've been able to access this at this point. Um, this, this feels far removed from the Siri or Alexa that we're used to making fun of. This version of this interface, if you will, is noticeably a step forward. Um, conversational ability is remarkable. And if you haven't seen the movie Her, now would be a good time to do so. The technology that's displayed in that film we're now super close to, if not on top of. From the BBC, quote, AI generated naked child images, shock town in southern Spain, end quote. So this is as horrific as it sounds, you know, from the depths of your nightmares. Apparently the pictures were, quote, created using photos of the targeted girls that were fully clothed, many of them taken from their own social media accounts. These were then processed by an application that generates an image, an imagined image, of the person without clothes on. So far, more than 20 girls aged between 11 and 17 has, have come forward as victims of this app's use in or near the, the southern Spain town. And in this case, it wasn't some creepy old guy that did it. It was a group of similar-aged boys who created the photos, which just goes to show the damage that can be done with this technology by teens with little to no understanding of the implications of doing something like this. While these pictures were artificially created, these girls will have to live with this forever. They did everything right, and they will still pay a price, which just goes to show how fast this technology has developed ahead of regulation. And since this particular article was published on the BBC, many females from across the world have reported similar stories. Uh, our next article from The Atlantic, quote, a new Coca-Cola flavor at the end of the world, end quote. So Y3000, the latest Coke flavor, was purportedly made with the assistance of AI. And this looks like it was largely a marketing gimmick with the 3000 and the name Y3000, meaning to be a reference to the year 3000. Apparently, the AI-assisted created drink tastes a lot like regular Coke. The important thing here, I think, is to show that there are no limits or areas in which this technology will not touch. Our next article is from The Atlantic, quote, so much for learn to code, end quote. So we talked about this previously. One of the biggest issues or uses of AI so far is 
its ability to assist in coding. Uh, there's been no shortage of stories written on the future of co- computer science majors in coding. I've said before that I took some coding courses back in 2015, 2016, uh, and I'm still seeing tons of advertisements for coding boot camps in schools. They're still out there, but the question is for, for how long? Computer science or coding at one time was a safe bet uh, for a solid career path, and now it's very much a questionable pursuit, at least if it is your planned career path. So from that article, quote, in the ultimate irony, software engineers that help create AI are now the American workers who think it will have the biggest impact on their livelihoods, according to a new survey from Pew Research Center. People will still get jobs, though they may not be as lucrative, says Matt Welsh, a former Harvard computer scientist professor and entrepreneur. He hypothesizes that automation will lower the barrier to entry into the field. More people might get more jobs in software, guiding the machines toward ever faster production. This development could make highly skilled developers even more essential in the tech ecosystem. But Welsh also says that an expanded talent pool may change the economics of the situation, possibly leading to lower pay and diminished job security. If mid-career developers have to fret about what automation might soon do to their jobs, students are in the especially tough spot of anticipating the long-term implications before they even start their career. The question of what it will look like for a student to go through an undergrad program in computer science, graduate with a degree, and go on into the industry, that is something I do worry about, says Tim Richards, a computer scientist professor at at the University of Massachusetts, told me. Not only do teachers like Richards have to wrestle with just how worthwhile learning to code is anymore, But even teaching students to code has become a tougher task. ChatGPT and other chatbots can handle some of the basic tasks in any introductory class, such as finding problems with blocks of code. Some students might habitually use ChatGPT to cheat on their assignments, eventually collecting their diploma without having learned how to do the work themselves. The potential decline of learn to code doesn't mean that the technologists are doomed to become the authors of their own obsolescence nor that the English majors were right all along. Rather, the turmoil presented by AI could signal that exactly what students decide to major in is less important than the ability to think conceptually about the various problems that technology could help us solve. The next great Silicon Valley juggernaut might not be seated by a tech grab, but a humanities grab with no coding expertise or a computer science grab with lots of it. After all, The discipline has always been about more than just learning the ropes of Python or C++ coding languages. Identifying patterns and piecing them together is its essence, end quote. So as of 2022, there were an estimated 1 to 2 million computer programmers in the country, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And the BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics, estimates that field will shrink by 11% between now and 2032. That sort of seems like you know, wishful thinking at this point. It's hard to imagine with what these large language models can do now that the field won't be decimated by 2032, but hopefully the field perseveres. Several episodes ago, we discussed uh, a guy by the name of Imad Mostak, who is the CEO of Stability AI. He's projecting that the field won't be around even five years from now. So we'll see if that happens. Our next article is from Yahoo, quote, Pepsi reveals truth about Tesla's semi-truck fleet after subjecting them to hellacious and dangerous delivery routes, end quote. So Pepsi is already experimenting with Tesla semi-trucks at Pepsi's Sacramento, California facility. They also have smaller electric trucks and vans in use. The larger focus of this article is the viability of Tesla's electric semi-trucks. Pepsi currently has a fleet of 21 Tesla semis in use at this facility. 
There's no information on if they're in use at other facilities, but the bulk of the trucks are used for daily trips that are less than 100 miles. They do use three of those Tesla semis for longer haul trips between 250 and 450 miles. The article, and there's an accompanying video, are really touting the environmental effects of using the Tesla semi trucks and Pepsi's goal to get to X percent of emissions by 2030. There was no mention of the conflict minerals involved uh, with running electric vehicles. Of course, this you know, will save Pepsi and every other company involved in transportation tons of money in the long run and saved fuel costs. So the minor capital costs that companies like Pepsi, you know, have to put up up front to get into something like this, will more than make sense uh, in the long run. The other obvious mention here are the trucks themselves. Some of the drivers of the Tesla semis were interviewed and gave glowing reviews about those trucks. There was no mention, however, of how those drivers felt about their eventual replacement by the truck and the self-driving technology. You know, once bureaucracy catches up with the technology, these companies will obviously cash in on driverless technology that comes with Tesla semis. So I should probably say, for those folks who are new to this podcast uh, and new to this, you know, uh, technological field that we talk about, and are not heavy into it. But there are driverless vehicles right now on the roads in major cities in the U.S. No drivers in them. Uh, So I think about Uber drivers um, immediately in the short term. And Elon Musk says that Tesla's big future are driverless taxis. So the guy or the lady dependent on Uber to make a living, you know, that's going to be problematic. Because it's going to be much cheaper for me to take a driverless uh, cab uh, to wherever I want to go versus paying a human to do it. And maybe uh, my heart uh, makes me use the human driver. But, you know, for only so long, I think the natural end of this are driverless taxis. And they do exist right now. I mean, although in pilot programs, they're on the roads. So... Companies like Pepsi uh, that are already utilizing Tesla semis in the name of the environment, you know, once that legislation is passed that allows self-driving, Pepsi's already going to have that infrastructure needed to make their fleet driverless. And it's a smart play. Why wouldn't they do that? Um, Now, just as a reminder, there are an estimated 4 million people in the U.S. working uh, in transportation or truck driving. Truck driving or transportation is the number one job for men without a college degree. And obviously this is not going to happen at once, but it seems inevitable that corporations will embrace the technology when it's widely available and legal and in the name of safety, not of cost savings. But cost savings will be what it's all about. Also, it may be that insurers will no longer insure commercial vehicles with human drivers as human drivers as human drivers will be far less safe than AI, at least when the technology is perfected. So it may help the corporation save face when they have to let drivers go um, that they can blame it on insurance companies. We'll see. But I think for the short term, at a minimum, Pepsi's going to have to have people in the cab of that truck to unload uh, those Pepsis whenever they those trucks get to where they're going. So I think even if driver technology takes over tomorrow, Pepsi drivers, truck drivers like that are, are going to be around for a while because they're going to need someone until, you know, robots are in mass production to handle the um, unloading of those trucks and loading of those trucks. So. So our next story is from the Washington Post, quote, chat GBT provided better customer service than his staff. He fired them, end quote. So this story made the rounds earlier in the year. A CEO at an Indian-based e-commerce platform fired his entire customer service platform and implemented ChatGPT as a replacement. From that article, quote, Shah, the owner, used the software to improve his in-house customer service chatbot, Lena, training it largely on his company's help center content. In December 2022, he let the ChatGPT-powered bot field nearly all messages 
and found his customers were largely happy. By June, he had fired 27 of his customer service agents and replaced them with Lena. It Quote from this guy, it was a no-brainer for me to replace the entire team with a bot, he said in an interview, because that bot is like 100 times smarter and is instant and who cost me like a hundredth of what I used to pay the support team, end quote. Well, there you go. Uh, this has sort of been my contention from day one, that corporations are not going to keep folks employed for the sake of keeping folks employed. I hope I'm wrong about that. But leaders like this guy, whose main priority is the bottom line, won't think twice about eliminating humans for AI if it means a better bottom line. And this particular guy, you could, I mean, his crassness comes across in that quote. He received com considerable backlash online when the story first made the rounds several months ago. But he's sticking to his guns. There's been no change in that. So, Also from that article, uh, it highlights the major concern for the customer service sector across the globe and how uh, imp much of an impact that will have. So from that article, quote, Specifically for customer service, there's a larger global concern. Startups, banks, and consumer good corporations say the technology can help them cut costly customer service costs while providing clients with personalized service. They argue AI will give remaining call center workers more support, helping them feel fulfilled in their jobs. End quote. Well, I think that's doubtful. I mean, helping call center workers feel fulfilled in their jobs. I don't, I don't think that's practical, especially if those customer service workers are constantly worried that that technology will outright replace them. But again, from the article, quote, economists and workforce development experts say the shift could have profound effects on economies across the world, especially in countries like India and the Philippines, where call centers provide millions of people with modest pay and work and where surveys have shown automation could render over a million jobs obsolete. The change is sparking a debate in the global south about what, if anything, they can do to prevent a mass workforce disruption, end quote. So the, the wider world's customer service jobs that were outsourced to places like India are once again going to be outsourced, but to AI. You know, the difference is that this time the jobs are going to a software and not another human Um and this doesn't have any reflection on the individual customer service worker. I'm sure there are problematic customer service workers. I've dealt with them. But even the best customer service rep with the best and sunniest disposition and the best response time will never be able to compete with an AI. Um, customer service folks are simply at the forefront of this disruption. And other classes of work will follow as the technology improves. Now, according to the... Bureau of Labor Statistics, there are an estimated 3 million people working in customer service in the U.S. And if this technology can be implemented here, and it can, as it was at this long tech company, how long will it be before U.S. companies start outsourcing their customer service work to AI? And, you know, I'm no economist, uh, but the reports I've been seeing, articles I've been reading about the economy are not cheery. Uh, are not cheerful. Uh, so if faced with a tough economy, if corporations understand that this technology exists and it's out there and they can cut labor in times of recession, uh, that's what they're going to do. So let's hope the economy holds and we have that soft landing we've been promised because uh, if not, it may expedite AI disrupting uh, jobs just like this. Our next article is from Forbes, quote, keep your pulse off my voice. Voice actors worry generative AI will steal their livelihood, end quote. So this is something we've discussed previously. The technology exists at this very moment to replicate or clone voices. The software that I use to record this podcast has the ability to clone my voice. I can choose to clone my voice in that software, have it read 
uh, a script I've written, and I could be putting podcasts out that way. So this technology is there. Uh, but this article highlights a particular voice actor who came across a TikTok video that was created using a, a synthetic copy of her voice. And she's naturally used to being paid for that service, so she was offended. Also, there's the content that's being put out by the synthetic voice that could be concerning to whoever's voice was cloned. At least prior to AI's voice cloning, voice actors had a say in what their voice was used for. Now they could be used to condone or endorse things that the voice actor doesn't agree with. Or worse, it could be used in, you know, AI pornography or racially motivated content. And this article also talks about the intricacies involved in trying to legislate against this very thing. Naturally, legislation is well behind this technology, and voice actors are banding together to demand their voices be removed from voice cloning AIs, but there's little they can do, legally speaking. And this seems, on the surface to me, like a dying industry. While it certainly is nice to have familiar voices narrate our books or movies, it's probably not far into the distant future that we'll become fully accustomed to or acclimated to using or hearing synthetic voices. That obviously doesn't bode well for the voice actor of today. I'm hopeful that they can in some way preserve their current way of life, but it seems unlikely. I was going to end there with uh, news articles for this week, but right before I recorded, at the time of this recording, I saw an article pop up that piqued my interest, and that's from Futurism.com. I've since seen it elsewhere that, quote, Facebook is paying celebrities millions to turn them into chatbots, end quote. So, you know, in a move that probably shouldn't have surprised any of us, celebrities are allowing Facebook to use their likeness uh, to turn them into chatbots. As if our culture wasn't oversaturated with celebrity already, get ready for more. As of right now, this is limited to text, but Facebook anticipates moving to audio and video soon. And given our obsession with celebrity in this country, this seems like, again, an inevitable move. So what does this mean? It could mean that celebrities sign a certain, you know, sign with a certain AI company to give exclusive rights to their likenesses uh, for chatbot purposes. So if you wanted Tom Brady as a chatbot assistant or chatbot companion, your chance is likely coming. You'll be able to converse with an AI Tom Brady in his voice and most likely in video chat as well. Huh, that's, a, that's wild to think about. Um, so I'm thinking about kids, you know, uh, will have theoretically, as fast as this is going, kids today, and my daughter, she's under five, I would assume that she will have chatbot friends, digital friends, uh, or kids her age will. I will. If you're listening to this and you know anything about me, I'm probably going to steer her clear of that. But it's feasible that kids will have digital friends. And if technology's taught us anything over the last 10 or 15 years, they're going to prefer those digital friends over real friends. So that will be a struggle to keep kids from going further down this rabbit hole because, you know, these AI chatbots are not going to be perfected early on. So you may be chatting with a Tom Brady who says an unexpected racial slur. I don't know. You don't know. I mean, it it's, could certainly happen. Things like that have happened with AIs over the past year. So, but this AI Tom Brady could become an echo chamber for your child, reinforcing the things that the child wants to believe. Um, of course, this can be applied to adults and politics and that sort of thing. But as, you know, globalization continues full steam ahead, I'm, I'm fearful that things like this will continue to distill down cultures across the globe. Uh, I was traveling in an English-speaking country a few years ago, and one of the tour guides remarked how the local accent was disappearing, especially amongst teenagers. That local accent was being taken over by a, quote, Kardashian-like affectation. And so when the tour guy said that, I, you know, 
I felt some level of shame that that's what America was outsourcing to the rest of the world. And I hate to think of foreign countries losing even a bit of their local culture to that sort of thoughtless media. And I'm guessing these celebrity chatbots will continue us down a path towards that type of future. Um, it's just wild to think about. So if you, you know, we're not watching the Kardashians enough, you know, your kid may be able to have one of the Kardashians as one of their chatbot friends or companions. Uh, that's where we're headed. So this week I wanted to talk about uh, the current state of AI, as me, a uh, layman, understands it. I, you know, I do try to stay up to date as possible. There's so much AI news coming out every day, it's impossible, that even some of the AI researchers I follow say it's, it's just too much to follow. But at this point, it's been 10 months since OpenAI showed chat GPT 3.5 to the world, and this marks our 13th episode, Lucky 13. I thought it'd be a good idea to look at how those things have been or how things have progressed up to this point. We started out this podcast highlighting a letter that was published within the AI community, which called for a halt on AI research as some, even as some AI researchers thought things were advancing too fast for regulation to ever catch up. But since that time, it's been all gas and no brakes on the AI front. Some of those same folks who signed that open letter have been investing in AI, and one, Elon Musk, started his own AI company in that time, though I think his efforts there are a bit more noble uh, than some others, as he's been, very few people have been as vocal as him about the dangers of AI. Another concern is AI companies operating outside of the few places where there are laws as it pertains to AI, the EU was quick to move on some sort of loose AI regulations that uh, AI companies were calling for. And when it was about to be implemented, some of those AI companies simply decided not to operate within those jurisdictions. Now, that's an obvious concern. It sounds good that these AI companies call for regulation, but at the same time, they're lobbying for less regulation and trying to circumvent it when it serves their purpose. Uh, one positive note is that it seems that AI has certainly struck a chord with the general public and elected officials. As slow as legislation is within the U.S., at the very least, there are a few emerging voices in Washington who are taking the threat seriously. I think legislation is inevitable. The question is, when will it be enacted and will it be too far behind the curve to be in any way effective? With the Ukraine-Russia war and now the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, let's hope it doesn't get lost in the shuffle. As big as those wars are, the implications of getting AI wrong are potentially world-ending. So let's hope that those folks in Washington don't lose uh, focus on AI. In our popular culture, it seems as if AI is everywhere, especially in advertisements. Obviously, I'm hyper aware of the term being used and look for it in most cases, but it seems to have broken through into the mainstream. Advertisers are, in some cases, overusing the term, in some rare cases, uh, using it for products that in no way use AI. But it is a buzzword. It's catchy and it's created quite the hype. So uh, I guess we should expect companies like that to latch onto it and use it to sell their product. Another positive note is that it, in, in some ways, has helped the U.S. stave off a recession, at least up until this point. The mad dash to invest in AI technologies has helped carry a limping economy through 2023. Some of the, you know, largest stock growers uh, of this past year have been largely software companies heavily invested in, in AI and hardware companies, too, I should say. Um, Paul Graham, uh, who, amongst many things, is one of the founders of Y Combinator, which is sort of a 
a type of startup incubator. Uh, y Combinator has funded thousands of startups, including like Airbnb, Stripe, and Reddit, that, those sorts of things. He's one of the more respected and objective voices in the world of AI and our tech field future. And a few weeks ago, he tweeted uh, this, quote, The scary thing about the speed at which AI is evolving is that it isn't yet mainly evolving itself. The current rate of progress is still driven mainly by improvements in hardware and in code written by human programmers, end quote. So the day will come when AI improves itself at an exponential rate. So if it's been hard to wrap your head around everything that's happened in AI in the short, these short 10 months, buckle up. I, I, don't, I don't think things are slowing down anytime soon. Uh, lastly, this week, I wanted to address some listener questions. As, uh, I've not done that in some time. First question is from Oliver in Canton, Ohio. He's asking, essentially, you know, will he be able to opt out? And I assume Oliver means can he opt out of our technological future? That's a very good question. Um, most of our references you know, are from sci-fi movie, sci-fi movies, I should say. So it's safe to say our views are not exactly objective, but it's hard to see a future in which we aren't living in a mass surveillance state like what's currently happening in China or the way of life portrayed in George Orwell's 1984. If you haven't read that, I would recommend going and doing that in the near future. Uh, opting out seems... Like it would be a wise choice. Though, again, AI is going to solve many problems, big and small for us. So, is the juice worth the squeeze? I don't know. That's that's a million-dollar question. Yeah, it's the problems it creates that is the big concern. The risk acknowledged by all the experts are enough to make any one question, you know, moving forward with the technology. But we're all, you know, like I talked about, it's all it's been all gas and no brakes this year. Uh but is some sort of existence outside the matrix, so to speak, practical? I don't know. I'd like to think when legislation finally catches up with the technology, rights will be assigned to those who don't want to participate in an AI world. I'm hopeful at least. But again, practically speaking, your existence would be much more difficult should you choose to opt out, much like trying to exist today without a smartphone. I'm sure there are those that do it, but it's, it's certainly more work. And, you know, just a, an anecdote, I was at a very public uh, place last weekend, and uh, I was waiting to meet my wife and child in a very crowded place. And I'm, I'm standing there, uh, you know, like a schmuck, looking for my wife and child in this sea of people. But what I'm noticing is the people around me and what they're doing. And I'm, my wife gets on to me from time to time for looking at people, but I'm a people watcher. I enjoy it. Uh, but in this case, it uh, was not encouraging. This was a very, I guess, what would be described as a Instagram-rich setting. A lot of uh, picture-worthy backgrounds. And uh, people were taking full advantage of that. And so these people were taking these pictures. I'm not a fan of taking pictures myself. Um, and these people are taking pictures of themselves. And the entire thing is completely superficial. They uh, hold their phone up, throw on a fake smile, and take the picture. And when that picture's been taken, the smile fades away immediately. Uh, I don't know. It just seems, you know, superficiality was, you know, between people was a problem pre smartphones, you know, uh, we had to contend with that, but it's only, uh, been exacerbated by smartphones and technology. And so I think the 
question is valid. Is this the kind of future you want um, where people are preferring the synthetic over the organic? I don't know. Um, there are certainly some attractive things about the uh, synthetic, but again, will it be worth the price you pay and what you lose in the organic? I don't know. Anyway, our next question is more of a, a comment uh, than a question, and it's from Javier in Texas. It seems unlikely that mass layoffs will happen as it will have detrimental effects on the economy. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think I talked about that here before. One of my hopes is that the adverse effects of laying hundreds of thousands or even hundreds of millions of workers off across the local economy or in turn the the world economy um the effects of that would be they just won't make sense i mean we, why would we do that to ourselves um corporations especially those you know creating consumer goods to lay out folks on a large scale i mean i've, I've it's almost like you're cutting your nose off to spite your face. And if you eliminate their income, they're unable to contribute to the economy. Both corporations and the workers are tied together to some extent in that way. And I have to think that even a few million workers who have otherwise led stable financial lives, having their incomes ripped away from them, would have detrimental effects on the economy. We discussed... Uh, an estimate from J.P. Morgan earlier this year in which they state that two to 300 million white-collar workers would be without work or have work greatly reduced by 2030. That seems wildly unsustainable for the economy. I think the thing that makes this technology different from its predecessors is how quickly it can be created and implemented at scale. Previous technologies took generations to implement which allowed for trades to be eliminated slowly while new trades were created slowly. And we just talked about how fast things are moving or have moved since chat GPT was released to the world. You know, greed seems, seems to be winning out and this is an obvious motivator for these companies. So I don't suspect that prudence will win the day. And just today we talked about the transportation industry, customer service, Computer programmers, which comprise roughly, these professions comprise roughly 10 million jobs in the U.S. alone. That technology exists at this very moment to significantly augment those professions. And this is a, as dumb as the technology will ever be. It's only going to become more robust. But again, I'm hopeful that our, technolog our technologists, I should say, along with our politicians, will land on the side of work being an important component to the human experiment and necessary efforts will be made to ensure workers aren't left out in the cold. So that's it for this week. Uh, next time we're going to talk about... So... If you didn't think this show was uh, depressing enough, we're going to talk about the psychological effects of unemployment and what that does to people. Um, but in the meantime, please be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You can do it with just a few clicks in the app you're using at this very moment. And if you want, you can be even more deliberate and just share this episode uh, directly via text or email to a friend or friends. Thanks for listening. We'll talk next time.